and welcome back to the What the Fork Sunderland Review Show. Bizarrely, I got my weekly prediction right as Sunderland took out a 1-1 draw with Millwall at the New Den, thanks to Dennis Serkin's um, punch slash header. There's plenty to dig into, as there almost always is, and joining me as two regular faces. First and foremost, as always, as he has been a lot this season, is uh, Brad Sharp. Brad, how are you doing? You all right? Yeah, I'm very good, mate. Um, yeah, it's just one of them games, isn't it? Like, you go away from home and you always say, as long as you don't get beat, you you would take it really in this division as we just came up from the League One take out the equation of we've had a very good start to the season although we're in the final third now I'm actually quite happy with a draw because I think this is one game this season I, I, I don't think that we played very well but we came out and got a point and sort of like we ground it out Second of all Ross Black Ross how are you are you okay? Yeah very good pretty much out on the same force as Brad Today was a com- total contrast to what we used to were like last week and against Fulham, where it was silky, exciting, sexy football. Today was an absolute battle against the better quality championship version of Wickham. <laughs> oh, I quite liked uh, Tony Mowbray's comments when he was like, yeah, you can choose to play football whichever way you want, but... Uh... You know, you'd have to stand up to it. It was just such a backhander compliment. But like ultimately I, th- I think I think you're right. And obviously I'll stick with you, Ross, for the first one. Um it's a really important point. I think it's not an easy place to go Millwall and, and get anything, uh, be it a point or, or a win. And I think there's only been two defeats they've had this season. I think they've won eight and that's their fourth draw to home. So there's not many teams come away from Millwall and get something from the game. That's why they're there. But um you've both sort of touched on it there you know we spent a lot of time about chatting about the fact that we actually play really wonderful football and we're such a nice team to watch and today was more about sort of guts and, and grinding a result out how pleasing is that for you to see like this pretty sort of football side actually gets it like doesn't mind getting their hands dirty and really dig in yeah it was massive I think especially for some more of our technical players <laughs> which mentioned how young we are and I think it's a a challenge that a lot of them wouldn't face, especially the likes of Mishu. Joe Gelhart on his debut, you know, like that's a baptism of fire when you've got like three centre halves kicking you non stop when you're near the ball. Um, but we, like you say, we've showed a different side of our game today, and it's a side that we're going to need as we progress. We keep on getting told it's about progression and challenge it coming out the other side of a challenge like that. But undefeated, I think, is a, uh, it's a big tick in the box. Of course, we like Mowbray has even said we, we didn't get our game going today. And that's one thing that was a bit disappointing how we couldn't I couldn't we couldn't put our presence on Millwall's defence as much as we would like until maybe Pritchard came on and he got closer and linked up. But I think other than that, it was a battle and it was all about grinding out. But I know a lot of it gets said about like our technical players, but it, it really showed how good Dan Ballard and Danny Bart are today. They were absolutely phenomenal. Um, the goal's unlucky, and it's actually a really good finish for their player on the floor. Um, but it was it was coming, to be fair. They, they had gained a bit of momentum on us. But I felt like Patterson pulled, got lucky with one, but then the rest of the saves he pulled off were brilliant. He was commanding in his area as much as he was allowed when he wasn't penned in by one of their giants. And it, it was just a, a throwback, home dinger, where you go there and you're just like, just get something and get out of there, basically. And we, we did that. And that's to me, I was happy with a point against a side who you take away, they look at the home form, only the top two who are unbelievably better than everyone else have got a better home record. So it, it tells you how hard a place it is to go. And you take the point, you move on. Yeah, absolutely. Brad, same question to you. We talk all the time about how good the football is and how nice it is to watch. And don't get me wrong, I'd, I'd much rather be talking about that. But um, I think it was it was really important today that we saw the guts and the sort of determination and the, the will to not get beat, um, will to win, whatever you want to call it. But um, how impressed were you with the, the lads' effort today and the fact that they quite literally took a punch in the face to make sure that we got a point? Yeah, I thought it was uh, it was excellent, really. I mean, because like you say, we've come accustomed to watching such good football. Um, that sometimes we, t- we take a step back and realize how young they, like how young these lads are, and for them to be involved in the game like that today and still give absolutely everything 
Um, I, mean, I think Edgar Michu said the Mopra in the post match thing. He came up and said, You don't get that in League One. That was quite difficult. And uh, the, oh, League uh, shall I say, if, if my French is on point there, in my I, I, waited, I waited for you to have that realization that he'd actually said League One. <laughs> you get plenty of them in League One, to be fair. Who are you yeah. for that? Um, it, 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 it was good. I mean, because we've, like I said, we've come that accustomed to watching very good football. It was sort of a little bit frustrating, but it was also nice when you reflect on it to think, look, we haven't played that well, and we've went to probably one of the more difficult places in the league, and came away with a point. And was such a young side. If you, it, I mean, if you look at the starting lineup or the players that were even on the pitch out the whole game, you say you take Danny Bart and Pritchard out the side who came on. Who's really on there? Who's got an experienced head? It was just a, a bunch of young lads who are used to playing good football and they had to adapt their game quickly to to put up with the, the shit houseery that they were trying to do. Mowbray summed up perfectly. I think I'll touch on it as well because we've touched on it in previous weeks as the referee. I've usually said that the referees have been atrocious in this league or <laughs> League One, this league, league uh, anywhere that you want. I'll give a referee a lot of credit today because there's times today where they were going down like they'd been shot and the referee wasn't buying it. And I thought that was very good. He let the game go a lot of times. There was like little hustles and bustles. He was just letting it go. And I thought the referee let the game flow, which although it was a poor game, it allowed it to be like a half decent game to watch on the whole. Um, but no, I, I like... The bands, this team are bands, and I'm very proud of them to come out of there with a point because with 10, 15 minutes to go before we scored, I couldn't see us getting back into it. I think we we're just maybe we we're going to make changes where it was like, well, if it comes off, it comes off. If it doesn't, look, we'll get back on the bus and we'll go again. But they dug in, and look, Serkin's fucking, he's put his career on the line there by chucking his head in the way. And it, it's it's just great to see that we've got a team of lads now. Even if they're not playing at the best of their ability, they all seem and still want to fight for that shirt, and they're, they're fighting for the badge, and they they just love playing for the club, and that rubs off on the fans because you're seeing the fans getting behind them, and I, I just think, albeit it wasn't great football, it was a really, it was a mature performance to try and get the point that we got at the end. Ross, you already sort of touched on um, Dan Ballard and, and Danny Bart, and I think it's probably hard to mention anyone outside of that. I, I've seen someone today talk about um, Dan Ballard at the end of the season going to the Premier League and probably being worth about 20 to 25 million. And I'm not saying I agree with it, but I found it hard to find reasons to disagree with it because um, he just looked class. But I think I think obviously we've, we've, we've mentioned Dan Ballard and we've mentioned Danny Bart. Um, so two that really stood out, but um, who who would you put down for a special praise today, outside of those maybe? Um, I thought Edward Michu really got stuck in. Like he showed a different side of his game of day. Like he was getting into big fifty fifty titles, physical battles, and he was just like getting up afterwards and be like, "I oh, then let's get on with it." You know what I mean? And normally, if you tell us like a month ago, we'd go to Millwall with two centre midfielders and Dan Neil and Michu, I'd be like, "Oh shit." Like that's that's a bit much that for for them too, but they both got absolutely stuck in. They were really good in the centre midfield, and I thought, especially on a day when our technical players did could didn't really affect the game. It was good that the players who we'd expect to get on the ball, like we mentioned, did did the dirty work, and he looked knackered at the end, <laughs> absolutely knackered. And like you say, with Mowbray, the. He's a good thing as well. Michu seems to be a lot more comfortable playing for Sun now. I think the first few months, he was probably the only one who never really adapted, who came in. He looked a bit lost, but now he looks at home in the championship. And he's also, like I say, we mentioned about learning experiences. He'll he'll come off that pitch today and he'll have learned something brand new about football that he would never have experienced before. He'll know now how to react to physical challenges what to expect at some grounds and against different oppositions and 
the ability, I think, what Brad said, that we came back, the mentality side of it was huge today, that we didn't get beat after probably not doing so much, and especially in attack-wise, to just keep going till the end. And, um, yeah, I'm, I was really impressed with Michu and Daniel in the middle because the, 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 the law that didn't get on the ball as much, I thought the defensive side of it was probably the best shown as a pair. Actually, really surprised by how much Mishu likes getting stuck in. I think I can't remember which game it was, but it was another game. That was Bora. Came on against Bora and like treated like a derby and just kept getting up. And I mean, the the kid's literally like seven stone wet. He's tiny, um, but he's got like a bit of swagger about him. I quite actually really thought he was going to be the one at the end of the season where we went, ah, that one hasn't worked out. Like the Diaku of the season, but um, he's looking more and more impressive game by game. But I think uh, Ballard, Bart, Mishu. I have a feeling, based on our WhatsApp conversation we had before, Brad, and the conversation we have every single week, there's another player that you want to single out that probably deserves singling out for his performances over the past sort of two months, I think, actually. But um, you, I'll, I'll let you wax lyrical rather than me. Wax lyrical, eh? Um, yeah, again, Trey Hume, for me. I just think with every single game he plays, he's learning something new. He's learning about the, the, the pace of the English game, the physicality of the English game. No, I know you only came from Ireland, but that's like Sunday League football over there, to be honest. What I'm starting to see more from him now is he's becoming more of a, a man, a more mature player. And he's starting to, rather than just happening to turn up in the, like, the right places, you can see he, he knows exactly where he needs to be. And there's times he's feeding it into like the likes of Ahmad or Roberts. And rather than let, letting them, them play like a little one-two into a football, he's bombing down the right-hand side to get by them. Now, if he doesn't get the ball, all he's doing there is he's dragging one of their players away, which allows them to do it. My, uh, Roberts and Ahmad, sorry. And it's allowing them to do their little bits. And to be honest, mate, it, it, every single week he impresses me more and more and more. And he's now becoming a player that you can't drop. Like where you said, if Gooch comes back, all like that. He is now, in my eyes, one of the first three names that goes on that team sheet because he's excellent in everything he does. His tackling is outstanding. His positional sense, it, he's like years above where he should be. But when he's got the ball at his feet, he always seems to pick either the right pass or if the pass is not on, he'll try and do it himself, but he'll get us in a better position. If he's going to lose it, he's only going to lose it by them taking off and to give us a throw in further up the pitch. It just seems like he's doing he's doing the right things, and that's got to go a lot of credit to the coaches and staff, in my eyes as well, because I think they're, they're drilling into him week after week after week. Right, we've done this right this week, but this one needs a little bit of work, and then the next week you see something else, which is just outstanding. And it's a credit because... Three, four weeks ago at the start of this window, maybe he's just before the start of the window, we were all saying, could Trey Hugh maybe he's do with a loan move? Because he's got something there, but if he gets a loan move, League One has a year, half a year in English football at League One, he'll come back a better player. But he's a great example of someone that's going to buy his time because he believes in himself. And long may that continue. He's been excellent for me. Yeah, I fully agree. I think he's been superb. I think he's been... But for me, he's the right back slot is his to lose. And then, um, you know, that's no uh, disrespect to Gooch and, and Niall Huggins, who are, are really, really rate highly. I think he'll he'll contribute an awful lot. But I think for me, unless Tri Hume has three or four really bad games these days, I don't think you can knock him because I think he's one of our best attacking options at the minute. He's defensively solid. Um, it's just like we've said before, I think that moustache has a power of strength. Um, and you know, full respect to him for rocking it in the way that he should. <laughs> uh, Ross is trying to show us that he's grown one. I know this is only an audio podcast, but um, Ross cannot grow a mustache. Um, Ross, I'll, I'll say this on the you, mate, but we had to come, we had to come on to it eventually. Uh, Pritchard came in for a lot of stick today. Can I be honest? I quite like the fact that teams like the Pritchard stick, Huddersfield done it, Millwall done it twice now, and like. He's got an assist and two goals. <laughs> so we've worked out what makes Pritchard tick. Um, I could have a bit of chat about him during the week. I can't remember which podcast I was listening to. I want to say it was Wiseman Say, but I could be wrong. 
and he basically he's got like a, a wee bit of of chat about himself where he is the kind of person that'll stand up in a dressing room. I'll be one of the first to stand up in a dressing room and, and give his thoughts. And I think he offers a lot of experience, um, a lot of quality and an awful lot of talent. He came off the pitch today, put a great ball in. Um, we've probably forgotten how important Alex Pritchard is. How important is it that we've got Pritchard back? Yeah, massively. Um, it was just good this week to have that bit of depth and quality off the bench. You know, somebody can, uh, who can come off the bench and make an impact. I think with Pritchard as well, I think his deliveries will forget how good. All right, he may, he may have had a dip. When I think he, he coincided when we didn't have a striker and he didn't have anyone to aim for, to be fair. But you forget how good his quality is in deliveries. And when you've got someone like the free kick who can put it put it right in the mix there for someone to just attack. But I also think he brings, especially the striker, into play a lot more because he always seems to be close to them and bring in the one twos. Um, I think he can. I think he does that really well. And but I think players like him coming back, it gives us options, and we're going to have to freshen things up with how many games we've got. Um, the five sub rule has changed the AFL. A lot, and I think like that's one thing that we maybe lack. So hopefully, with players come back to full fitness, it's something we can then use to our full advantage. I mean, touching on what Pritchard there, I mean, what what I seen different when he came on is we started pressing that extra five, ten yards higher up, and usually that's what Ross Stewart does. Ross Stewart presses from the front, but what I noticed when we were missing a striker is Pritchard was the man that would go on the press early. So, when it was usually Watts and the bank with Pritchard behind him, today, when Pritchard came on, we weren't pressing as good as we could. As soon as he came on, it was just that extra five or ten yards where the rest of the team know, right, he's going to go early. So, all of us can now step up five or ten yards. And it sort of relieves a little bit of pressure when it comes to the middle because if it one of their centre midfielders get it when they're on the turn, our press is so high, either our midfielders or one of our centre halves are going to step out and take it off them. And I think that it just makes us look a better side. And I think that's what we were, we were missing without Ross Stewart. And then when Pritchard came in, I think we got that little bit more togetherness where everyone sees one player that's going to press. And if, rather than if you haven't got your, your out-and-out main presser, shall we say, I don't know if that's a football term, <laughs> but like your, your main man that is going to lead from the front and press, the rest of the team are wondering right, who's going to do it, who's going to be the first one to commit, and then we'll go with them. You always know if Ross Stewart or Pritchard are on the pitch, they're the ones that are going to press first then that allows the rest of the team to take that extra five or ten yards. And as soon as Pritchard came on, you've seen the team sort of change the dynamic of how we were going to be without the ball. And it was great to see him back. And the thing is, we talked about injuries last week. I think I listed like all the players that had been out for like three games or more. And the, the list was like basically a full squad, um, or at least a decent side that you could put out, minus a, a blooming goalkeeper. Um there's been a lot of worry about obviously strikers and midfielders and being a bit short, and there's still obviously of course a worry about the striker. But and um, Serkin and Pritchard coming back today, you know, we've touched a lot on Pritchard there as well. But but Dennis Serkin, well, we've seen what he did today, and he, and he offers an awful lot. I think um, it's a lot more physical than people will give him probably credit for. Dennis Serkin, um, I think you know there's times when Alessi would play at left back because you would deem him to be a more physical player, but actually I think Serkin's more physical. He's taken a crap. He's taken an uppercut today. To be fair, to get the goal back, um, I shouldn't laugh. Bless him. The guy was at cold. Didn't even know he'd scored, did he? Um, but Dennis Serkin coming back as well, Brad. How how important is um? I was going to say our Den. Uh, I've never ever called him that in my life. Like, but um, how important is is Serkin coming back? Well, our Dennis, my granddad, cause that's his name, Dennis. Um, <laughs> um, but, yeah, um, I mean, we spoke, and it seems like ages ago, cause it, well, it was, but before the Middlesbrough game, he was probably one of our most important players. And that was the Middlesbrough game at their place, and then he got the injury. And, yes, we said, well, he came in, he'd done well, and he got his injury after that. Um, Dennis has been in and out. Like you said, I think people underestimate how physical he is. He is like a little. He is a little tank. He he doesn't back out of a tackle ever. Like you'll never ever see him back out of a tackle. And today he like he literally put his chin on the line. <laughs> like he 
in you for a fact going in there, and anyone knows going in for something like that, there's a 50% chance you're going to get hurt. Heads are going to collide. You're going to take a good right hand to the jaw, which, by the way, like Tyson Fury, he, that, that goalkeeper will probably knock you out with that. Um, It's just excellent. And I, I, like I say, I think people underestimate it because maybe he's, he's, two ones, he's two one-footed. So people just see him as on the football. He always tries to get on the left-hand side and obviously... Defenders are going to read that, and no way he's going to go. But people underestimate like how strong he is. You see him going one on ones, shoulder to shoulder. He'll get people out the way. But in the last year, another person that was said over the, when like he he, he he progresses, he's getting so good at going forward. I mean, a year ago, I can guarantee you, when we first signed Dennis Sirk and he was just breaking his way in the first team football, we wouldn't have seen him in the box putting his head on balls like that against Wigan. He's got around the back post, got his head on it. There's been other occasions where he's maybe just missed. We wouldn't have seen that a year ago, and that just goes to show that these players that we're bringing in have got a lot of potential for the future, and it's just coaching it out of them. And we're starting to see the rewards of Sirkin because we all knew how good of a left back he was, but now we're seeing him more how good he is going forward, how good he, how vital or influential he can be in the box. It, or, I mean, you say the Wigan goal wasn't a set player because we played it quick, so it wasn't classed as, but today we scored direct from a set player, which was put you on the Serkin's head. And he was just in, he, he's just, I, I, I do think he's an excellent footballer. I'd, I'd be like to say, if, if he continues how he started at the start of the season, there'll be a lot of interest in the summer for him. Because if you take his injury record this season alone, out of it, I think a lot of teams will look at it and think he's only 21, 20, 21 year old. And they've seen how much he's progressed in one year. What could they do with him in the future? Now, that's good for him, but it's also, in a way, good for us because that's part of the model in inverted commas. Um, that if they're not going to be able to take us to the next level, that they're going to bring a lot of money in for the club. And I think Serkin's one of them players that will do that. They'll either stay with us and help us progress because he is getting better and better and better but he's also going to have that resale because there's not many better out and out left foot left backs in the league out that I've seen this season anyway No and you're right he is just getting better um, I think it was a few times last season he kind of frustrated me but now I'm looking back in hindsight I sort of understand how much he learnt from last season and how much he's applied it to this season and I'm not going to lie you're right in what you're saying He's another player where I think come the end of the season there might be a wee bit of interest there. Um, and based on the quote unquote models um that we have and the models that we use, depending on how much it is, you you don't know if that's something that'll be taken. But thankfully, nothing to worry about at the moment with that, which is uh I think vastly important. Ross, a quick one I want to chuck at you. There's a lot of debate about it today. Personally, I I don't really care. And I don't know if I have an opinion on it. I actually struggle with it a little bit to kind of decide what it was. Um but a few people thinking the keeper should have been sent off red card for the for the foul. Are you kinda of in agreement with that or do you think that is probably just a bit harsh? I think it's a bit harsh because there's nothing intentional. The ball's every one. It's the same as a tackle really if you if, if the header didn't go in then it's a penalty and a yellow card. But it's the same as like a mistimed tackle. You know what I mean? With the keepers it's like they were allowed to use their hands to go for the ball. It's exactly the same. So I think if, if, if certain header doesn't go in the back of the net, it's a penalty and potentially a yellow card. But to me, it's never a red card. I think I think if you if you send and keep us off for trying to challenge for the ball, you you're into they've literally they've got they've got any chance going forward. Have the keepers they they get protected enough? I think. I think it's funny. I don't know the um with the the red card. I, I actually struggle to comment on it. I know I should probably. Go and have a look at the rule book, but um, I couldn't really find if the goalkeeper accidentally uppercuts your left back. What card should it be? Page of the book. Um, so I'm not entirely sure, like if it, if it not been intentional, but the obviously, I mean, it would have knocked quite a few heavyweights out there. I think it was a crack and punch. <laughs> it, it, it was a it was a great hook, like to be fair, and it was crazy though because I don't think I've ever seen a Sunland equaliser in front of two and a half thousand fans we celebrated less like we scored and everybody was just like shit he's dead 
Like the stretch I was on within seconds, it was mad. It was it was really really clear. The country or, or, or someone scored, but someone's in real danger. <laughs> so the the were in danger, and for a second that would nobody knew who it was. To be even fair. Some, even even all the journalists who online when someone score, they normally like goal whoever. Sunland itself tweeted just said goal. Nobody knew who it was, and then he must have just he, he sat up like Undertaker, and then and Sunland just tweeted Dennis Sergan, <laughs> and then that's, that's when we knew who'd scored. Me, Graham. It's if you start giving red cards cards out when something like that happens, which is just a complete accident, then goalkeepers no longer can come and try and punch a ball because they're in danger of being sent off. Sergan's put his head in there. The keepers went to punch it, which he's entitled to. And Sergan's got there first, and he scored a goal out of it. Yeah, if if there was a um, if we had missed, and VAR was there, probably would have got a penalty out of it because it is a late tackle. But it's never a red card for me. Yeah, I, I kind of think I probably agree with it. To be fair, um, I probably don't think it is either. Poor Dennis though, getting like a wallop straight in the face, um. Far too handsome and good looking to be receiving punches like that. So maybe I've changed my mind and maybe that should have been a red card because Dennis's face should not be touched in that manner in any way, shape, size, or form. Um struggle week on week to find negative sometimes here, but like I've kind of got half of a one here, but I kind of feel like I've really forced it. So if people think I'm being overly negative here, to give me an advance. But um I don't think Gelhart necessarily had a dream debut, Brad. Obviously, it was a tough game for him to get into. But the biggest thing for me is that he looked vastly different to what Ross Stewart and Ellis Sims are. I, I wasn't 100% convinced he was a centre-forward, if I'm honest. Um, how much of a concern should that be? Not a concern for me. Um, he looked different because he is a different type of player. It would have been a lot of a different debut if at that one point where Roberts has picked it up 30 yards inside our half has danced through half of London and just squared it to him because Gal Hart would have put that away and he'd have got a, a goal on his debut and would have been sat here waxing local saying what a great debut it was because I thought the first 15-20 minutes when the ball was coming into him he did look quite a little bit nifty a little bit dangerous um, without maybe he's creating the space that he would usually get. And look, we've only maybe, I know a week's a long time in football, but we've only had a week where we've known Ross Stewart isn't coming in. Or Ross Stewart's out, sorry. We've only known for four or five days where there's going to be no other striker coming in, so Gellhart's going to be the main man. So we've had to try and adapt a little style of football to, to play to that and then go into Millwall to do it. It's probably the worst place you could go to because of the size of their players. Like it's just like one brick wall. Um, it's not alarming for me. I, I did see enough, especially like I just said in the first 15, 20, 20 minutes. I've seen enough to think, look, if we can maybe just change one or two little things, Gelhart will come good to us. I, I can't see him getting on the end of things and scoring. And like I said, this just takes one or two little breaks of luck. If Roberts passes that ball through and where he's open, rather than taking it himself, he scores. But if Roberts scores that one, we say, wow, what a goal. He's, he's, he's ran the full length of London and scored that. It's just one of them things. I, I, I'm not too concerned because I know he has got bags and bags of talent. And look, he's not going to play on... He's not going to be playing on Wednesday he's not allowed so we're going to be playing without a striker um, but I think it gives us a good week now on the training ground to maybe change one or two things to play to his strengths see what his strengths are um, and go from there he's a good player he, there's, no, there's no doubt about it oh yeah absolutely like I say I felt like I was kind of like really searching for anything that was even a slight negative if I'm being completely honest with you I think yeah, I asked the question, but I'm not that concerned. Um, I think the kids obviously got like shed loads of talent, and anything that's worried me this season eventually has worked out in the end anyway. So I don't know what I'm worried about. Um, because I think we'll, we'll work out a way that benefits him best and benefits the team eventually. It just might take a few weeks of tweaking, and I don't think today was the 
the best game for someone of Gelthard's quality and ability and Diallo's and the likes of Roberts um, to necessarily showcase that ability because it was, a, as we said, right at the start of it, the kind of game where it was blood, guts, thunder and uppercuts. Um, Ross, obviously, one more question, the most important thing. Uh, that game's now done. So we drew 1-1 one, one with Millwall. That's where we're at. Fulham on Wednesday, bit of a free hit in many ways. Um, excited for it, or are you kind of more concentrated on on Redden next week instead? Um, I think the the draw dangling the leads at home adds a bit more spice to it. Really, um, I think the fact we haven't got a striker is a bit of a dampener. But I'm also interested to see how we do it and how what team puts out because we played so well down there. I just, if the if the game's the same quality and the same style as it was down there, it'll be a brilliant game of football. But I just feel now with um with Redden that we're still in touch with the playoffs and I just feel like a, a good win at home. It is the most imp- more important. But then also you you if you can beat a Premier League team at home with no strikers and then you've got leads at home in the next round, it's 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 big. You know what I mean? There's no way about it, it's big. So I'm looking forward to seeing which team he puts out. I think it'll be good to get more minutes in the legs of Pritchard. Especially, I think it'll be good even if we can get an hour out of him on Wednesday and then, you know, just progressively get more minutes in his legs so, because he's going to be needed. And I think, tactically, Pritchard could also give us a bit, get a bit more of Gelhart because he's one who, although he can't play as a striker, he can play like just in behind as a 10. And I feel like with Sirkin coming back as well, we could see us go back to like a three centre halves with wing backs. I, I don't know how it would work with the way Roberts and Amada are playing, but we we we've got that with players coming back, we can mix it up a bit rather than being rigid in our systems all the time, especially mid game when you're making changes. So I feel that's why I'm interested to see what team he puts out. Does is he going to have to rest players because? That would have took a lot out of some players, especially like some issue today. I feel like it, it'd be good. Luke O'Nine's back. How does how does he where does he fit in? Does he does he play in the back three? Does he does he does he play right back and you rest Hume because Hume's played a lot of games for the first time non stop? Does Huggins come back in? I noticed he wasn't on the bench. Hopefully that's just a precaution because he played forty five minutes down down London against Fulham last time out. But yeah, we've got good defensive options. We got players coming back. Gooch is not far away. You know, you got Equa. Is Lahaji going to be back and ready yet? Has he got his work permit? You know, we've got the, the wax and lyrical about him in training, so he's clearly showing something. The only I thing is, that... Lahaji can't play Wednesday because he wasn't registered for the original tie. No, right. So you can, because... you can only have players who are registered. So, like your likes of Bowen Nine and Pritchard, although one was suspended, one was injured, they can play because they were registered. But your likes of Lahaji, he, he, he can't, unfortunately. That's a shame. But then again, that's another option. We've got to come in the league and then hopefully in the next round, if we can get through, you know, it, we've got options coming back now to give players rests and make impacts during games. But I know I've, I've, I've went a bit on from, am I looking forward to it? Whenever we play at the minute, I'm looking, I'll, I enjoy watching them. We're a good team to watch. Even when we're not playing well, we're battling and you're seeing players improve like Hume we're seeing proper progression in players miss you so even players who were four months ago were thinking well I didn't have it and cut it and now regulars in the championship so even if players do have a slow start and they don't really play much I've got full belief that by the end of the season the start next season with the coaching staff we've got they'll be ready to play in the championship next season I thought Anderson came on today and he looked okay he looked yeah, settled he he's a big lad him, isn't he I didn't realise he was he- that tall yeah, he's, he's quite a tall lad, but like he came on. Now, you don't know what to expect. And uh, I don't think he would have probably even got a look out of it if it wasn't for a certain injury. But he, he looked okay. And it looks like there's a player there. So, yeah, I'm confident as well. I think um, taking all that in the, the equation with all these players that are kind of improving, like human, unless he's probably better than I ever thought he was going to be, Anderson's to come in and look steady today. And obviously, there's room to go over him. And I'm sure we'll see more from Geltar as well. But even away from the club, whilst also technically technically staying with the club, Jim and Teddy got man of the match again today in a top of the table clash. I know Plymouth got beat, but um, he won player of the month in his first month at Plymouth and he's 
he's went and won uh, play the match in and probably their most important match of the season and probably the best two sides in that league. So that's also massive. We're seeing players that, you know, aren't even here are improving um, and looking like they'll be able to add in the, in the months to come, which is great. But um, a short and sweet one, but ultimately really happy again. Another great point, something we, we, again we can't complain about. Um, just consistently positive here and it's just great. Uh, it's fab. You don't necessarily have to be taken over by Saudi overloads to be happy with the way that your football clubs run, or you don't have to spend two hundred to four hundred million pounds or whatever, um, to be happy with how your football clubs run. You don't need to sell your soul to be happy with how your football clubs run. Is the entire message of this entire podcast. But um, Ross and Brad, thanks very much for uh, joining me once again. Um, we will be back next week with the preview of before the Redden game. I am in Madrid, so pre-warning for people who ask me where the review show is next week. I'm in Madrid. I'm going to be having loads of sangria. There'll not be a review show next week unless I trust Brad and Ross to run with it. Uh, more than that. Go on. Go on. I dare you. I dare you, Graham. I'm going to leave it to a vote. A Twitter vote. <laughs> Twitter, Twitter is vote. the barometer now. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> Drop your comments below and subscribe in that. Thanks very much. Cheers, Rad. Uh, Rad? <laughs> Brad and Ross. <laughs> Welcome to the Rad Podcast. <laughs> Cheers, Graham. <laughs> Cheers, G. Rad and Ross. Uh, cool. Thanks. One of my mates I was watching it with doesn't really watch football much, but he said uh, when he's seen it, he looked at him and went, Well, he's wearing pink boots. What does he expect? <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> um yeah. Hey.